for your daily anointing upon our lives, for the guidance you give to us, for the blessings, Lord, for everything you've given us in life. We thank you for that, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Touch us, God. Help us to draw near to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I thank you, God, for it all. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, you appreciate the Lord. Amen. Amen. I do. I love Jesus. Praise God. He's wonderful. Amen. Hallelujah. Appreciate the Lord today. Amen. Well, we got some out. Some. I think Brother Elber's still trying to get Bambi, isn't he? He's still black patterned, trying to get Bambi for his last chance. So after this, he'll be, Bambi be gone. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Amen. It's good to have all of you here today. Appreciate you being here, being faithful in the house of the Lord. Praise God. And uh, appreciate what God's doing. Appreciate the things that God is speaking to the church. Amen. Now, I don't know if you believe them or not, but I do. Amen. Now, the Lord has said he wants to take us to another level, didn't he? said there's some good things that we're in store for. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, excited about that because uh, God... Amen. Never lies. He'll he'll back up his word. He'll do what he says. Amen. And uh, he's been uh, extremely good, and we're so grateful for all that the Lord does. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to lay much today. We're going to uh, go ahead and receive our offering right now. We need to pray for Brother Greg White. He's not here because he's uh, uh, got a health problem, and uh, they found a couple of cysts, so they're going to have to go in and do surgery. And uh, so we want to pray for him today. Also, Brother Harry, who's had surgery, uh, he is uh, doing a, some better, but he's dealing with a lot of pain. So uh, let's, uh, they may send him to rehab. They had not really, I don't know if they, may be in rehab, but did he didn't tell me. So I don't know if he's transferred him yet or if he's just gonna leave him in the hospital. Uh, he called me, told me if they dismissed him, could I run up there and get him right quick? And I told him I could, because some, some have trouble driving in that I mean, we got a mess between here and Houston, amen. It's like driving in a, <laughs> a tunnel up there with all those construction sites. But uh, I told him I could, but he hadn't called, so I assume he's still in the hospital. All the time I said, I can't come this Sunday morning because i got to preach. And I said, I can't be there Sunday morning. Other than that, I'll come get you. But let's pray for him and Brother Greg because that's serious stuff they're dealing with. And, uh, of course, keep others, you know, this battling constant things, Brother Corey. Amen, uh, amen. People that's going through things with their health, and uh, we're aware of all that. We pray for God's blessings. And I'll tell you something else you should pray continue. It's God's blessings upon his kingdom, amen. Praise the Lord, amen. We need that continually. So uh, you give us the Lord's bless you to give, and he will bless you for giving. Father, we're thankful today for the spirit of the Lord. We pray, God, for Brother Greg and Brother Harry today. Lord, that you would touch each of them as they go through this thing of surgery, Lord, and Brother Harry's done been through it. God, we pray you'd touch his pain, God. Lord, touch his body, and Lord, touch whatever's causing the pain and cause it to go away, Father. Lord, we pray for a healing in that situation. We pray for Brother Greg, God, that you'd keep your hand upon him, supply whatever needs he has in his life, physically, emotionally, spiritually, God. Lord, touch them and keep them, Father. Lord, bless those today that's going to give to the kingdom of God. And this is how your plan is for supporting and financing the kingdom in the earth. And we thank you for the faithfulness of the people of God that do that. Lord, we pray your blessings upon them as your word has instructed it would be. In Jesus' name, and amen. Praise the Lord. All right, amen. Hallelujah. Well, we've got Christmas out of the way. We've got Thanksgiving out of the way. we got all that out of the way. Now we got... Uh, a whole year just to serve the Lord and to walk with Him and to do great things. Amen. Yeah. I noticed you got something, Brother Jerry. A lot of people this time of the year seem like just people starting over, kind of. It's a time that we make all these, uh, uh, I call them New Year's resolutions, I guess. Uh, and of course, some of them are destined to fail before they ever start. But anyway, uh, we make all these, uh, we are ambitious, we make these resolutions we hope to do. And, uh, but it seems like it is kind of a time of renewal many times. Brother Jerry and him did a lot of prayer and fasting for a week in Serbia. Said God had gave them new direction and they had received. That's what it's all about, receiving direction from the Lord. Amen. And uh, we do want direction from the Lord. And I appreciate the direction God's given us. 
and I'm excited about the things God's doing. And uh, uh, we've been praying about the finances and everything around here that God would help us. And uh, just Karen, you ever figure out where that check come from? <laughs> was it an old account? It was something else. All right, we got it. We got a check to bail. We didn't even know where it came from, but. Uh, it went to my old address here over yonder on my lane that I hadn't lived in about five years. But uh, uh, we appreciate everything that we get, everything that goes to bless the kingdom of God. Amen. So, uh, amen. Now, that may be their way of transferring what she tried to transfer. That's what it was. They, uh, she tried to transfer some money, so they just sent us a check. But uh, I appreciate everything that everybody does and all the people that uh, watch online. And, you know, we got a lot of people that watch online. And uh, there's a lot of people that follow this ministry and that go to our website and listen to the messages that's preached and listen to, uh, and even in rightly dividing the word, Brother Summers was telling me there's been thousands go up and listen to my teachings on eschatology. Every once in a while I get a uh, call from uh, or email from Australia or someplace like that wanting to know where there's a church like ours in Australia. I said, man, I don't even hardly know where there's very many in the United States, much less Australia. Amen. I have no idea. Amen. So, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of, there's uh, truth going out and hopefully one day many people will open their hearts to truth and kingdom living and uh, we just appreciate all that God's doing. Let's get the children going here. Y'all get mad if I let you out early today? Would that, would that upset you? If it is, I can drag it out now to 1.30. Praise the Lord. If, uh, all right, you know what age is, what is it, 2 to 12, I think it is, something like that. And we're working on trying to get something for the teenagers on Sunday morning. We, uh, you pray for us a big financial miracle so we can build, and we need another, we need more space, amen. And you see why we need more space. It's a little different last Sunday, isn't it? Amen. Last Sunday there wasn't, there was a lack of children because there was so many people gone, but uh, this Sunday, a lot of them made it back. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. Let's just, uh, we got all the teachers. Is Eric a teacher? Who's the other one? Josh Ruby's teaching. All right. Stretch your hands up here and let's pray for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, we pray your blessings upon these children, Father. We pray you to bless them and touch their minds that they could receive the word of God as it's brought to them on a level that they can perceive it, God, and put in their heart the desire to serve you all the days of their life. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Because that's what we want, that desire to serve God all the days of their life. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, uh, well, uh, I appreciate the Lord today so much, and uh, I've tried to spend some time down here. I was somewhat hobbled because uh, I've been trying to transfer over to uh, another Bible here that's got bigger print, and it's not set up like my Bible is that I've used for 40 years, so I've been lost. And uh, But uh, I actually went to find my Bible, and I think I left it in Arkansas, the one I've been preaching out of, so I was really... Uh, I can't find it anywhere anyway, but I hope I hadn't lost it because I just spent $300 getting it refurbished. So uh, I do want it, uh, I do love that old Bible because I know exactly where every scripture is on the left-hand side, you know, so far up, marked with red or whatever. And this thing here, I don't know where nothing is, amen. It's the same chapter and verse, but it's located in a different place. So I'm having trouble finding anything. So you'll have to bear with me today if I'm a little slow on getting things out. I didn't have time to print them out on paper. But uh, uh, I just was uh, down here yesterday evening, last night, and uh, something about this uh, morning special. Uh, she said she didn't see me come in. I must have went through an invisible door. I said, I got here way before anybody else was here. So I got up at a quarter to five, something like that. So uh, most of you weren't here when I come in today. In fact, I was alone. All people here when I came in was me and Jesus. Amen. But uh, I wanted to wanted to kind of be in meditation and thought and prayer and for what the Lord wanted. I'm excited about the fact that God is uh, giving us some prophecies that he wants to bless our church and do some good things for us. In the book of Luke chapter uh, 9 and 23, uh, I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures uh, to start with just for text. 9 and uh, 
23. Uh, <clears throat> if you guys are just at the kid and get with me, because I'm going to be a little slow. I'm going to look it up myself. That way that'll give you all time to find it and get it up there uh, in the computer part. And uh, just as Jesus speaking, he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now this was a requirement of Jesus in order to be one of his disciples. And then again in uh, First, Second Corinthians 4, 16, <clears throat> and... Uh, the writer said... For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Now, some translations say, though our outward man is decaying. Now, I don't know if any of you are getting old enough to realize that the outer man starts decaying as you get older, but uh, I'm old enough to realize that. So, uh, I used not, what people talked about, I'd see them walking with a limp or uh, <clears throat> see them hurting or... Uh, my mother had a sign that said, if it don't hurt, it don't work. And, uh, you know, she was 80-something years old. And uh, I've decided, well, there may be room for that sign. I need to go try to find it again. But uh, uh, I'm learning about that. Why? The outer man that we're in is not going to last forever. We are, we are given a space of time. And I have actually preached about that. All our life is actually a short space in eternity. And, um, and really... Uh, Compared to what God is and was, He always has been, He always will be, He's eternal. Uh, and I'm learning what it is for the decaying man. But He says, though this outer man is decaying, the inner man is renewed day by day. We can keep the inner man renewed. We can keep the inner man alive. We can keep the inner man active. I can't do what I used to do physically. It would be impossible. I used to grab a chainsaw. It'd be a hundred and something degrees. Go out there and cut logs all day long. Uh, if I had to do that right now, it wouldn't be very long. I'd be passed out somewhere in about probably about thirty minutes. But uh, I remember by seven o'clock in the morning, I'd have water running through my leather boots because it was so hot out there running that chainsaw, and uh, stay there all day and uh, work and work and work and do things that was almost humanly impossible. It seemed, but you had to feed my family, so I had to do it. But uh, you know, this outer man, now I look at, I've developed diabetes, I've got uh, all kind of things happening to my body, I've got a left knee that you see me walk with a limp, it's, uh, it got hurt when I was actually first came to El Campo, I hurt it real bad, and it's, it's deteriorated everything, and I had an x-ray, and they said, well, it's bone on bone, so you can just leave it alone till you can't take it anymore, and we'll put a new one in, so I uh, I said, my hips bother me. They straightened my hips and said, your hips the same way. you got bone on bones. And said, uh, you can take it as long as you can. We'll put you in a new hip. So that's what I'm doing. I'm taking as long as I can, but the hip bothers me more than the knee, so I walk with a limp sometimes, especially after I sit a while. But uh, got things we battle in the flesh, you know. But in the spirit, he said, it can be renewed. We've got to keep this inner man, the spiritual man, alive and working for God. Amen. And... Uh, he said, I like, I'm going to have to think daily. He talked about daily here. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to preach a little thought today and talk about it. And uh, you can just, if you need a, just a short title, you can just call it Making Room for Jesus. But really what I'm going to be talking about is making room for Jesus in our lives on a daily basis. Because the inner man is renewed, he said, day by day. It's a daily thing. And he said, you've got to take up your cross daily. And uh, so having things, you say, well, i got Jesus in my life. No, we, we have him there, but we've got to make time for him. We've got to make a place for him and time for him in our daily lives in order to go to the next level. Now, God said he wanted to take us to the next level. Well, any time you go to another level, but you've got to remember the prophecy said that it was... Content, it was uh, Conditional. You know, people don't realize that prophecy is conditional. When God says, I'm going to do, I'll give you a few times, you could say, well, this man was a false prophet. He said, he prophesied this, and it didn't come to pass. Maybe somebody repented. You remember how God even went to the extremes of having a man get swallowed by a fish? Some people said a whale, but the Bible didn't say a whale. It just said God made a big fish 
Now it might have been a whale, but I don't know. But the whale of a fish, I'll tell you that. But uh, and uh, so uh, it was a big one because it swallowed a man whole because he wouldn't go and prophesy. And the prophecy was that 40 days in Nineveh will be destroyed. It, it, you know, it didn't say anything about unless you repent. The message was 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Well, in 40 days, Nineveh was not destroyed. So was he sent of God? Was he a false prophet? No, because Nineveh repented. See, prophecy is the foretelling of the mind of the spirit. But there's conditions and, uh, involved in that. Let me give you another one, uh, just real simple like. God prophesied this one himself. I brought you out to bring them in, he told Moses. Right? But how many knows Moses was brought them out? But how many of you know Moses never got to take them in? Why? Because he smote the rock instead of speaking to it and God wouldn't let him go in. But when God spoke the word, he didn't say anything about it being conditional. Now sometimes he, he tells you it's conditional. If you do so and so, then I will. You remember those prophecies? They're in the word of God too. If you will do this, then I will do that. Well, I'm going to tell you most of the time it's like that. Because what he prophesies to you is the foretelling of the mind and the will of God that he wants to do and will do if we'll do our part. So if God's going to take us to another level, and anytime you're going to go to another level, I'm going to tell you, that I've, been, I've been doing this a long time. I've sought God a long time. I've been praying. I've been fasting a long time. I've been... Uh, you know, trying to find the mind of God a long time. I've been trying to do the will of God a long time. I've been in this thing for years, 40-something years that I've been doing this. So I feel like i got some things that you might want to listen to. I've had some trial and I've had some error. You made mistakes, yes, because I didn't understand the things of God like they really were. I thought they were one thing. They were really another thing. You learn this as you walk with God. He said, learn of me. How many remember that scripture? He said, learn of me. And when you walk with God over a period of time, you learn some things. And there's been times that I've really touched the deep things of God. And I've walked in some secret places with God. I've walked in some really deep places. And God, had, in those deep places, he spoke to me things that I will never forget. Does he do it all the time? No, he doesn't do it all the time. It's when I was in a place of sensitivity. I had uh, died out to myself to the point I had sensitized myself to hear the voice of God. And sometimes that took a long time. Sometimes it was following a long fast. Sometimes it was uh, the miracles I told you about happened that time when we all, God healed everybody in our church after an all-night prayer. Well, that all-night prayer followed an 18-day fast. Seek, you shall find. We read about the good things, but I'm going to tell you, there's a price to walking with God. I hate to tell you this. I, I mean, today in time, people don't act like it's just out there. You don't have to make any sacrifices. You know, to just get the Holy Ghost, and you never have to, you know, just come to church once a week, and, uh, and everything's hunky-dory, everything's just fine. Well, it never was like that with my life. If I sought, I found. If I didn't, I didn't. Praise God. That's just all it was to it. Matter of fact, one time I didn't understand spiritual growth. And I was in a time of really seeking God very hard. I mean, it's just like, you know, an extreme condition. And uh, some of the extreme conditions I can tell you about is that when I shut myself in my office there for six months one time, just came out for food and water when I wasn't fasting and going home at night. But I basically preached on Sunday, preached on Wednesday, I think, then we had Wednesday night service. But I basically just shut myself up with God. That's extreme. Yes, it is. But that's how you hear the mind of the Spirit if you really want to hear the deep things of God. And it's because of that and some of these seekings that God revolutionized this church. We don't think like it caused me to have to leave the movement I was in. 
and come into a whole new mind, walk out with nothing and walk in a whole new mind frame of the mind of the Spirit and the will of God. But if you really believe what God's telling you, and I was offered to be able to stay in this, but they said I, I couldn't preach anything God had given me. And I, I didn't even hesitate. I just said, well, you just want us to forget it right now because take this license right now if that's what you want because I will never deny what the Holy Ghost has spoke to me after I have sought him and sought him and sought him. So I'm just saying all that, that I have been in some deep places and uh, we have seen God do some powerful, powerful things, uh, powerful healings, powerful miracles, powerful prophecies, uh, revelations of the Spirit, probably my most powerful thing and that was prophesied to me by a prophet uh, that that would be my greatest gift is the prophecy and the prophetic gift as far as just not just prophesying to men but the, the word of coming to me understanding God hearing his voice and uh, being able to be hear it to the point that you actually could understand what God's saying to you when he's leading you in a whole new uh, direction that you have never went and most churches don't go you understand what I'm saying most people just follow whatever the church is doing and uh and, you know, that's why Jesus said the blind lead the blind, we'll both fall in the ditch. If the leader's wrong, we're all going to be wrong. And so I just really wanted to hear from God. I just really had a desire for God. And uh, so I have walked in some places that God spoke to me things. Uh, and this, some of this is coming out of what I'm going to share with you this morning. Uh, these are things that God showed me in, in uh, times of prayer and deep prayer with him of what it takes. Because every time I went to another level in God, it requires change. Because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So don't just think you're just going to keep coming to church here. And for you, there's going to be a lot of change unless someplace in this visiting the church, you catch the vision of the body and the vision of God and decide, I want to join in and be a part of that. Hello. Hello. Now, you can be a part of the blessings of God if they fall in the church. But really, really when it happens, when every individual in the body makes the change that it takes to go to the next level. But to go to the next level requires change. It's going, anytime you go to a new level in God, you're going to change something you're doing. You're going to make a commitment. You're going to stop something and create something else. You're going to change. If you don't change nothing, nothing's going to change. You understand what I'm saying? You got to make some type of commitment, God. Uh, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna pray an hour every morning or something like. That. You got to do something to have make time for God. You got to you got to do something that you hadn't been doing. And uh, so when we want to, uh, I, I really want to wanna teach this because I really think this is what we deal with. We talk about going to the level, you know. It, it uh, we want to make the changes that uh, it takes to bring this to pass. Now Jesus was pretty hard. And uh, when he uh, talked about discipleship, and uh, I just marked the thing here, right? And uh, when he when he was talking about discipleship, listen, listen to some of the things he said. I'm just make a dwell on him a long time. He talked about some of the things necessary was, and I read some of my text was cross bearing and, and uh, self denial. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, "If any man will come after me, this is Matthew 16:24." If any man come after me and let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. This is what's going to be required. He said, if you're going to be my disciple, this is what I'm requiring. Brother Smith, that's hard. That's what he said. He required renunciation of the world and things like that. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me <coughs> and hate not his father and mother, wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, even his own life, <coughs> he cannot be my disciple. Right, that's, right. Amen. that's tough, isn't it? She tell me to hate my mother, my sister. When you really put this down and study all the scriptures together, if you read that one scripture, that you think that's exactly what he was saying. Because in our minds, that's what he's saying. <coughs> but what he's saying is, my love for me, your love for me is going to be so great it's a priority statement it's what it really is. I've got to come before family. I've got to come before your mother. See, when I came into the Pentecostal movement, my mother said, you're not satisfied with Baptists? I said, well, right now, mother, it looks to me like they're not teaching everything the apostles taught. 
So I'm not satisfied with them. And uh, so, you know, I can't let my mother influence me, you know. I can't let family influence me. One fellow said, well, I'm a Baptist, like my mama was a Baptist, like her mama was a Baptist, and her mama was a Baptist, like John was a Baptist. Well, John the Baptist wasn't a Baptist organization guy. It didn't come into about 1600 or so. But anyway, he was just a baptizer. So people are just, you know, they get something in their head, they get stuck in something. But he said, you got to renounce, you got to put me first, what I want done first, ahead of all the family and everybody else. you got to love me more than them. He said, you got to leave everything. Luke 14, 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Wow, what you got to put me ahead of everything you got. I come before everything. Praise God. That's tough. I was thinking. Some things I put my family through. I remember my wife was talking about last night. We didn't have no money, have anything. And we didn't know what the will of God was for our life there during the period of time. And I was traveling up in North Carolina in an old car with my family, trying out churches, looking at churches, didn't have nothing. She said, and she said, I remember I was hoping to that this guy would invite us to stay at her house or something. He said, or maybe just sit him by and say, I hope he invites us to eat. Me and the kids are so hungry. Sometimes, if you really are hungry for God, there's a cost to it. If you're really searching for the will of God sometimes, there's a cost to it. And he did. He invited us home to eat and gave me some money because he, I guess he perceived I didn't have any. We have, when I got a call to go to Colorado, I didn't have a dime to my name. But I knew it was the will of God because he had confirmed it with prophecies and prayer. But God provided and always made a way. But there seemed no way. He always. But that, when, when people stop in the middle of the street, that's not at the church, <laughs> and walk up to your door and knock on your door and say, I, I don't know what happened, but God spoke to me to give you this money. God can take care of you. You might not be driving the fanciest thing on the block. You may not be living in the fanciest thing on the block. We was living in all we could afford. But God knew where we was at. And he always made a way. When it seemed that there wasn't any way to be made. He always provided. He never forgot. Like he said, you just go and preach. You just take your script. I'll take care of the rest of it. And I've watched God do that to the point, yes, I can preach faith. Yes, I can preach there's a God. I have a right to preach my God will take care of you. I watched him do it when the things were impossible. But I've also watched God as I prayed in an altar one day on April the 14th. You know what happens, I think, the 15th. I mean, you probably don't, you, you, but it's, you know, taxes are due. But I was praying, and God, I need money for my taxes. I hadn't got no money for my taxes. And a man walked through the door back of the church and laid the amount of money I was praying for on that altar. It walked out. Now, you can say that's coincidence. You can say what you want to, but I say it's God. Amen. And all he told me was, 
really big miracle, really big miracle. I've told you the miracles. I spoke my faith that I was going to General Conference one year and didn't have no money. And the evangelist asked me on the way to 7-Eleven to get some bologna so they could feed the evangelist. And an old man that we used to go there said, you going to conference? Yep. You riding to church going? Yep. I said, you got any money? Nope. <laughs> he come through on his way to conference. He said, brother, you ain't got no money. Is the church going to give you any money? Nope, they ain't got no money to give me. Matter of fact, I need to help them before I go. Church ain't got no money. You ain't got no money. Brother Smith, this is Sunday night. We're leaving Monday. I mean, that's tomorrow, you know. I said, yep. How you going? I said, faith. This is what gives me the right to preach for him. I, I got out of 7 Eleven. A man walks out of 7 Eleven, walks up to me, and says, God told me to give this to you. Couldn't even speak good English. Handed it to me. He said, He asked me first, said, How much you need? I said, Well, I got to help the church. Now I got to get there. I got to, big guys said, This is back in the 80s. Things weren't how they are now. I said, I need at least $1,000. He said, Man, how you going to get that? That's my faith. That man. I took it. He said, what did he give you? I said, I don't know. I counted out in the seat. Ten $100 bills. He handed to me at a 7-Eleven store. Let me give you a scripture. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always. Even to the end of the age, I'm going to be with you. Amen. This outer man perisheth, but this inner man is renewed day by day. So when you get ready to go to another level, there's times I wanted to go to, I've had God speak to me, deal with me for months about another level, talk to me about another level. And as a church going there, what is it going to take to get there? Jesus got some demanding stuff here. Yes, but there's a lot of reward in it. See, uh, but when he was, you know, giving us what it took to be a disciple, he, uh, he also left the choice to us. He didn't say you had to leave everything and follow me. He didn't say you had to take up your cross daily and follow me. He just said, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to. Now, you don't have to do what I'm telling you, but you just can't be my disciple. You can't be a follower of me if you're going to go your way and not mine. If you're going to do your will and not mine, you just can't do that. See, uh, what he put on him was, on us was very demanding, but he left that choice to us. And uh, so we realized there. And then, in, uh, I want to read, uh, well, never mind. No, I will read that. Let me, let me read another scripture because it's going to be a time. 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. See, the things of the Spirit, and the Bible teaches me in Romans that the carnal mind, this human, is enmity against God. It's the enemy of God. It's not subject to the law of God. It can't be. It's the very enemy of God. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people want to get ready to go to the next level. Well, it's the demons. It's why I can't get there. It's demonic forces in the city. It's demonic forces in the world. No, it's not. Because Jesus defeated the devil at Calvary. Amen. They do not have the power over you to do that. If you don't do it, it's because you chose not to.
You chose to go your way and do your will rather than go God's way and do His will. You see, it's, it's, it's getting the spiritual mind at work. And uh, it's not that. It's uh, probably not what's keeping you from doing it. But I'm going to show you what Jesus warned in the Bible that what's really keeping folks from uh, doing His will. And uh, in Luke chapter 14, uh, and I'll try not to just run you to death with Scripture today. Uh, may not get nowhere near all I got out here, but I want to get some of them. Uh, it's a good thing about this. You can quit at any time. When he's saying here in Luke chapter 14, we read this in uh, verse 27. He was talking here. He just finished telling them something. And who said doth not bear his cross and come after me, can I be my disciple? Then he talked about, he said, I'm going to give it like, he said, for instance, a man starting to build a tower. He said, he's got to sit down first and make sure that he's got enough to finish it, lest when he gets the foundation, he can't finish it. And everybody's going to mock him, laugh at him. You know, he don't have the faith. He said uh, that people are going to mock him. Saying the man started to build, but he wasn't able to do it. He said it's like going to war against somebody. you got to sit down first and make sure you're able to do this. Unless while these people are a great way off, you realize they're going to whoop you. you got to send an, uh, 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 an embassy, he called it, but really there's an ambassador to try to talk them out of, let's make peace together, let's, let's do something here to, so we don't have to fight one another, because if we do, I know I'm going to lose, you see. He said you got to make sure you can handle what you're starting out to do. He said, uh, likewise, uh, Whosoever of you that forsaketh, not all that he hath, cannot be my disciple. This is in 33. And uh, he went on to say salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, its ability to save, its, its, season, its saving power, how is it going to be seasoned? It's not good for the land, not fit for the dunghill, but men just going to cast it out. He that it is to hear, let him hear. In other words, he was making a purpose here. Now what we don't realize <laughs> when he said all this, he was following up a parable. And I think it's essential to get the parable. <laughs> it was the parable of the Great Supper that he prepared. <laughs> Sometimes why we miss God is so simple. And he said, uh, I want to go out now and invite people. The supper's ready. Go out and invite people. This is the first part of Luke. It starts around verse 16. <laughs> goes all the way through verse 24 where he's talking about this. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, he said, uh, a certain man made a great supper and he, he, he bade many, he invited them to come in. But he said, when I did, now he's teaching a parable of him and his kingdom here. And basically, most of the Jewish people were be applies to anyone that would reject the kingdom. He said, I, I can't come. Why? I bought a piece of ground. Demonic powers are holding me down. I want to come to your supper, but demon powers prohibit me. No. He said, I bought a piece of ground. What does that represent? Materialism. I've got so much junk that I've got to do and take care of. I don't have time to come to your supper. Well, another said, I've got five yoke of oxen. What's that occupation? I work all the time. Spend all my time making money and, and providing and, and my whole thought life and my entire life is consumed in my work. Another said, I took a wife. What's that? Family. The things that kept these people and finally they come back and said, Lord, nobody's coming. They all, they all made excuses. What were their excuses? The materialism I have, my possessions that I own, that I'm so busy taking care of. I can't come to church Sunday. I gotta, I gotta get my bass boat polished. I gotta take care of my God. The Cowboys are playing today. You can't expect me to miss church for them. Put Jesus ahead of the Cowboys. You gotta be crazy, man. Hello. Hello. Did you know when I studied and got into some real deep, heavy stuff that I won't go into because it, 
it's, it's just, you, you wouldn't understand it. It's just, it's just too heavy. But this is demonic stuff. But the plans I read of the people that are still trying to, right now, have given us all the problems in America and trying to control America, these money people. Their plans was, when they had their first meeting in 1894, I believe it was, the first thing they wrote was, we're going to get the men of America's minds involved in sports so that they won't realize what we're doing to America. They won't care what we're doing to America. Now, I would ask you, are we there? They wanted to make America a welfare state was another plan. Are we there? They wanted to change the Godhead and corrupt the Godhead. Are we there? You see, a lot of the things that's happening in our world today is a group of people that want to control you, and they're not God either. They're demonic. And but I won't. I won't. But I'm just saying. You know, they knew that we'd get our minds so much into that that the men wouldn't even think about. You know, there was a there was a a city took over last week in Iraq, and Christians began to be slaughtered. Men, women, and children by ISIS were slaughtered on a daily basis. How many of you heard that on the news? Not one ounce hit the news. Because our news media is a rotten poison that's controlled by these people to control your minds. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a part of mind control. You believe it or not, I don't care. But I'm telling you the truth. It's a part of the mind control that goes on in America. If you don't listen to the news, you'll be uninformed. If you do listen to the news, you'll be misinformed. Come on. I'd just soon to be uninformed as misinformed. I'm telling you that a lot of this stuff, but that really doesn't, a lot of that we can't do anything about other than pray. But what people are paying up, and that's why I hate dispensationalism so bad, it reverses this thing and makes the people that's doing it look like the people of God and makes the people, well, I won't get into all that, but I just, I hate it. Deception is a powerful thing. And self-deception is a real powerful thing. So the thing that kept people out of the kingdom wasn't demonic forces. It was they were too busy with everyday living to have time for God. You know what's going to keep this church out of the next level if we stay out of it? It's the fact we're just too busy with materialism, with work, and with family to have time for God. And that's why if we're going to go to the next level in God like he's told us he wants us to do, we're going to have to make room in our life, in our schedule, in our daily habits. You know, habits are a hard thing. Once you get them, you get up every day at six. I go, You know, we got this thing. Well, then we looked the other day, prayer's not included in none of that. We're going to have to have a prayer time. We're going to make ourselves a time with the Lord. We're going to set aside and make room in our life for some time with Jesus. Because if you make time with Jesus, then you'll know, begin to know his will as you seek him. How many knows he said, seek and you shall what? Find. Knock and it what? Shall be open. Ask and you shall receive. The reason I got through some of the revelations I got, and I didn't even know what they were. I mean, I didn't, they were revelations because I didn't know they even existed. But, so, but I knocked, I asked, guess what? I found. You got, if you really want to know the will of God, you've got to make time for Him. We're too busy. 
And you saw what the, 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 the things of discipleship were. You've got to leave it all. You gotta, you're going to be my disciple? And uh, that, that's, what it, that's what it followed when he began to give his terms of discipleship. And he said there's a cost to it. There's a cost to it. You've got to sit down and figure, do I really want to do this or not? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, everybody in this church ain't going to go to a new level. Because some of you just ain't going to make that kind of an effort to do it. I ain't going to do what that preacher says. You don't have to do all that stupid stuff. None of these things move me. That's right. Nothing moves you. You are set in concrete. How many knows that in our daily life, we got kids in school, you know, and I don't anymore, but I'm, I'm preaching to where most families in this church are. We got children in school. We got activities after school. We got husbands and wives working. We got, um, you know, a lot going on after activities. Uh, make a living. We got all this stuff that's just everyday living. And how many knows it consume every hour till at night you're so tired sometimes. All you won't do is just pass out. But if we got any time, we'll flop down in the recliner and turn on the TV instead of turning on Jesus. And this hour we had for prayer. We'll watch gun smoke. Somebody don't even know what that is, but <laughs> now I'm gonna tell you, there's some movie, there's some things I've seen on TV. I've never watched them. I can't watch them. <laughs> Why? I got the Holy Ghost. And my spirit won't let me watch them. There's a show called The Walking Dead. Anybody ever seen any of that? You don't want to hold up your hand right now. No. I saw just enough to see, realize what, what, what I've seen advertisements of it. I've seen, I've seen a portion of it. I said, this thing, my Holy Ghost turned flips when I seen that stuff. There was another one. I forgot what it was, but I wouldn't watch it either. And it had something to do with these things getting on the back of people and actually becoming a part of them. When you really saw the end of that, that was about demon possession. Being controlled by demons was the underlying, but people don't catch that. See, there's some things in there. Big old scary. I don't watch scary movies. It's just it's not a part of me. I don't want anything to do with them. Somebody stay behind the door. My <laughs> God, I have nightmares all night long. Man. I got enough to deal with in life without all that. I don't need that in my life. Dear God, I don't need that. I've got enough things trying to slip up on me and stab me already. I don't need anything else. I don't need some living in imagination to my mind on top of what else I'm dealing with. And uh, I, I just don't deal with it. But uh, it don't matter if what I'm doing is totally harmless and it's a good show, even if it is gun smoke. If, if I'm not taking any time for God during my day, I'm missing the will of God. How am I going to go to another level with Him when I don't even know Him? How can I get in relationship with him when I don't ever have time for him. You know, we're married to him. You let a marriage go where you, you know, you're a young couple and you don't ever have time for one another on an intimate basis, that marriage is probably going to fail. We need to make time for Jesus on an intimate spiritual basis. We've got to make room daily in our life because this inner man has to be renewed day by day. And what's eating us up and destroying the church in America today is not a bunch of demonic forces. It is the fact that we're too wrapped up in everyday living to have time for God. We've took all of our time and used it up and we have nothing left for Jesus. Jesus we're, you know what? You know what? Some people feed their dogs. They feed, they, even it's in the Bible. Even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the master's table. 
we throw the scraps. A lot of times, you know what we give Jesus? The scraps, what's left over of our life. We spend our quality time doing things we want to do. And then when we ain't got any time left, and we're, not, you know, we're tired, and we're wore out, then we want to throw Jesus a few scraps. Lord, you better take care of me. I'm too tired now. I'm wore out. Man, I, I mean, I yelled for them folks. I, I thought them texts was going to lose. They just wore me out, put them pull them out. <laughs> Dear God, ain't nothing left. It wouldn't be so funny if I wouldn't tell them the truth. <clears throat> I, I can't read all this stuff because it's going to take up too much time. But, <laughs> you know, there's something in John that said, uh, First John, chapter 4. I, see, I, I really got further down, but I'm going to... You know me, I just preach all over the place like I don't know where I'm going. It's, uh, I want to read it because there's a scripture on Love not the world. These are the things that's in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it is of the world. The world passes away, the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. All this stuff we're wrapped up in, it's going to pass away and not mean nothing. It's just like the old outer man that's decaying every day. But this inner man better find a way to get renewed day by day. And uh, we realize that, uh, you know, He don't want us living on the world. Another place, James even called us, called it to the church. He wrote to the church and said, you adulterers and adulteresses. He called them adulterers, the church. Don't you know that the friendship of the world is enmity against God? He said we can't live in the world. We've got to live in this world. You just can't be given to it. Y'all don't follow me. You just can't love it instead of God. Amen. See, that's the one thing God showed me, the most important thing about going to another level is you're going to have to develop spiritual focus. Amen. And, uh, you know, you, you can know things, but you've got to do something about it. Uh, for instance, okay, uh, Matthew 6. I use this a lot because it's, it's probably one of the most powerful Scriptures God's ever really, you know, used me to show me all this stuff. And, uh, and uh, Matthew 6, where he talked about, Lay up not for yourselves, verse 19, treasures upon earth, where moth and rust that corrupt, thieves break through and steal. Anybody ever got a brand new car you were so proud of? I'm sure we've all had that. I remember I going to church one time. He never had nothing years ago. He got a, he had a bunch of kids, a whole bunch of kids. And he, he got him a brand new, he don't come here no more. Uh, I ain't got to talk about him, but I'm going to call his name. But you won't know who it is. But anyway, he got a brand new car. Man, he had sheets over the seats. Don't you eat no ice cream in his car. Don't you drink in his car. Six months later, they go by the church one day. Kids all over everything, ice cream cone hanging out the window, you know, <laughs> waving tea. You know. That stuff just don't last. How many of you still driving the same car you drove when you first got one? What happened to it? That sucker just went down. Did it? That, just, that stuff don't last, man. That stuff, that stuff won't carry you nothing with God. I mean, I'm thankful for the blessing of a car that I can depend on, but it don't carry you nothing. The last, matter of fact, the last two cars I bought were both, one was a 2001 model and the other was a 2002 model that had 100,000 miles on both of them. I'm still driving them. Why? I paid cash for both of them. I have no car payments. I like it. Oh, you need to drive something fancy. Well, that's fine. 
I just drive something cheap, it works. But I, you know what I did? I bought good cars, the sound cars, that's known to usually go about 300,000 miles. I don't go buy a piece of junk now, but I mean, I don't want to be working on it all the time. But you go got good, solid cars. Why? I mean, you, need to, you need to represent the kingdom, preacher. Well, you don't represent the kingdom with the car you drive. I've seen folks drive fancy cars and act like idiots. You represent the kingdom with the spirit that's in you, the Amen. spirit of Christ that's got in your Amen. life. That's where you represent the kingdom. Good. You represent the kingdom of God, by the, Jesus said, by producing the fruits of the spirit. When you get in there, he said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. What's he saying? Whatever you value in life, that's what you're going to think about. See, that heart there is not this blood pumper. That's your mind. That's your mind. You've got to get this mind focused on God and the things of God if you're ever going to go to another level in God. You've got to do it. I don't know how to do that. Well, you've got to figure a way. You've got to make room in your life for Jesus or it ain't going to happen, baby. He's no respecter of persons. You seek, you'll find. You knock, it'll get opened. You ask, you'll receive. And uh, he said, whatever you love, that's what you're going to give yourself to. That's what you're going to. He said, where moth and rust is corrupt, thieves break through and steal it. Don't lay up. He said, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where this stuff can't happen. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. What you value in life, that's what you're going to think about all the time. And that's what you're going to pursue. If driving a fancy car is your thing in life, you're going to constantly be pursuing how you can get another car rather than pursuing how can I please God. Matter of fact, you've got to watch that because there's an element of pride can go along with that, okay? And I'm not a, I like cars. I like cars. I, if I had the money and was a rich man, millionaire, I might drive the fanciest thing out there because I could do it without it bothering me at all. You know what I'm saying? It wouldn't hurt me. I could do it without it hurting me. But, I mean, I'm not against but I can't let that dominate my thinking and my life and my heart. I can't. And that's just one element. There's so many folks. Some folks are into clothes. Some folks are into this. Now, you can tell I'm not into clothes. Amen. So, I see some preachers, they make me feel bad. They get up there and they got them press suits. They, you know, a little hanky sticking up in here and just tie on and choking to death. <clears throat> but he went on to say, the light of the body is the eye. Really, that's the mind. If therefore that eye be evil, the whole body is full of light. What he's trying to show you, the heart the mind, and you've got to get your eyes single, and you've got to get it set on the Lord. If your eyes evil, it's your body's full of darkness. You want revelation to God, you've got to get you, your life singled on Jesus. You've got to get your focus on Jesus. You've got to get your love turned to work. Now, we still got to go to work. we still got to make a living. we still got to drive a car. we still got to do all these things. I understand that. But that's not where your big focus in life is. Your big focus in life is how to please Him while you drive that car. How to please Him at work. How to have time for Him what you get off work. And no matter how busy your schedule you get, that you shut down some time in your life that day. Maybe 30 minutes at least. 15 minutes. Sometimes maybe an hour. I'll tell you what, if you shut it down enough, your 15 minutes someday are going to turn into an hour and a half. And it won't be just because you're pressing yourself to pray. It's because you touch something all of a sudden that you don't want to get up and leave. I'll be honest with you, I prayed an hour before just to get rid of self and get to the point I could touch God. That don't make no sense to nobody, but it does to me. He said, here's the thing. No man can serve two masters. Oh, I can't, Brother Smith. I got it, man. I got it. I can handle it. You just, you just can't handle it. I can handle it. No, you can't because Jesus said you couldn't. He said, you're either going to love one and hate the other or you're going to, you know, shun one and desire the other. You, you can't do it. You, you just can't do it. He said, no man can serve two masters. You just can't do it. And he said, now why are you taking thought, for, I'm going to share why you know it's the mind. Why are you saying you're taking thought for your life? What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on, I'm going to shorten it down. You see them lilies? He said, they didn't toil, they didn't sew. I took care of them. 
Quit spending all time worrying about how you're going to get ahead. You don't have to go steal. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. Just, just go do your job and, and serve me. I'll take care of you. I'll bless the job enough you'll be took care of. I'll take care of you. Amen. Don't focus on that. He said, the lilies ain't taller than someone. I took care of them. He said, how much more will I take care of you, oh ye of little faith? That's what he said, oh ye of little faith. You got to worry and see and anxiety about what we're going to eat. What we're gonna, that's what he said. What we're going to drink. What we're going to put on. What we're going to wear. How we're going to live. How we're going to take care of everything. He said, you see them birds up there? I took care of them. I took care of the lilies. I take care of everything. I can sure take care of you. He said, I'll tell you what you do. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things, I can add it to you there. See, when you put him first and you ain't got any bread in the house, he'll stop a car in the middle of the street and send a man to knock on your door and hand you a hundred dollar bill. Amen. Believe it. And I can tell you, I can sit here and just tell you one miracle, money miracle story after another. And the reason it has to be a money miracle story in this preacher's life because money ain't never been my thing. It's just something we use. In other words, I'm not here desiring money. I'm here desiring to do the will of God. It takes money to buy food. It takes money to buy clothes. It takes money to do that. I understand that. But that's not my focus. The money just comes. And that's why Jesus has stepped up to the plate when I was in a bind and I didn't have no money and he sent somebody and gave me the money. Because he pled, he kept his promise. He never left me. He never forsook me. He said, you just put me first. You just take care of winning souls. You know what? In that year, when, we, when that happened, in Colorado, we had the fastest growing church of our kind in the state. When I went, took that little church, we was running, I think we had seven people in our first service. Boy, that's a lot of tithing to go for. It. What brought you to Colorado? Money, man. Out of all that money them people had. Yeah. And some of them was babies, by the way. You know. But you know what? If you put him first, at the end of the year, we was running 80 something. And we're in a little old Dunk City. Oh, wow, I was teaching Bible studies. I was going about my father's business. I bought an old car, an old uh, Buick. Man, that sucker was huge. Y'all remember the old big Buicks? I mean, that, that thing, man, it was long, dude. <laughs> I went down the road like this. <laughs> I need an extra work car. I bought a paid four hundred dollars for a Buick. Man, that was a big dude. I drove that dude the whole time I was there, and when I left, I sold it for four hundred dollars. <laughs> ain't bad. That thing didn't have no, it was real world driving. I was up in that ice and snow one day. I was driving down the road, and all of a sudden, my car just Flip. Now, with any other lane going backwards. I said, these tires are too bald. I got to go get something. I finally made the service station. I said, put me them ground grips with cleats in them, get nails in them. I, buddy, I could go in. Mm. <laughs> you know when I took them cleats out when I moved to Texas? I guess they were going down the road. And just, that was another car I had. Them in. That's right. I sold that one up there, but I had them in another car, too. I just, when I got to Houston, I had to pull them out. Houston don't have a lot of eyes. I get a lot of sweat. What are you saying? Don't focus on those things. Just get what you need to make it in life, but focus on Jesus. You know what? We need to focus not on our kids being the greatest athlete or the greatest person or all that. We need to also focus on them knowing Jesus. Amen. One of the best things you can give your kids is a family prayer time. It doesn't matter if it's just five minutes. If you just, before you go out in the morning, say, let's all gather around, we're going to pray. And you pray God's blessings over your whole family before you go to work, before you leave. And, and them children, that'll put something in the children that they will recognize 
that you really are sincere in what you're talking about God. Amen. You can't just tell your kids to live for God if you're acting like an idiot. I'm, I'm, I need to get, you know, I hate to preach anymore because I'm so out of touch with reality how preachers preach today. Yeah, My language is just way out there. I'm way back, you know. I'm from the old gunslinger days. I just tell it like it is, folks. I told a guy on Facebook the other day, I said, you know, God just came, even God can't fix stupid. Some folks are just stupid. They just, and God won't even fix that. They just, you got to change that yourself. You got to work on that, you know. And, but he's telling us here all these things that we just not to get involved with something else, but we need to focus on him. And uh, in the parable of the sower, when you read the parable of the sower, you know, there was something that they received the word and, uh, and, and uh, one of them said it fell on, you know, just, Satan come and talk the word away. And that's true. It just steals right out of the heart because they're deceived on one thing. I told a woman that one time after I taught a Bible study right here in El Campo. She walked out the door. She saw it. She wanted to be baptized in Jesus' name. She wanted to get the Holy Ghost. And the Lord spoke to me and said, it's Satan come and took the word away. I said, whoa, ma'am. I called her back. I said, God just spoke to me. She said, what? She never heard of that. She was a Lutheran. She said, what? She, you know, they don't know anything about speaking to God. God speaking to them. They just, you know, it's just, I mean, they don't believe it like we do. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and and I'm, not, I'm not against them or nothing. They just don't believe it like we do. I know I grew up a Baptist. I never even heard anybody hear from God. But I, I preached a preach 30 minutes. Then went outside and shook hands and smoked a cigarette. I went to sleep most times. I sat there and popped my neck in church so I could I didn't know anything about God. I thought God was that man on a staff up there, you know, in front of the church, that big picture had a staff and some sheep by him. I thought that was God. So I didn't know anything about God, didn't know nothing. Right. But I said, uh, God, and I explained that parable to her. I said, somebody's going to come and try to steal this word. You go, oh, no, no. I seen it. I'm ready to be baptized. I see it. Nobody's going to get it. She called the next day, put off the baptism. She got with her preacher, and he showed her where she didn't need all that. What happened? Satan come. Took it right out of her heart. Then said it fell on stony ground, didn't have enough root. So when, you know, it wasn't enough root to sustain it. So when opposition came, offenses came, they just quit, left. Then said it fell among the thorns. What is the thorns? He said it choked the word. It became totally unfruitful. Got it? Had it. What were the thorns? Let me read it to you. Verse 22. He that received seed among the thorns. This is uh, Matthew, by the way. And uh, I guess it's chapter 13, verse 22. He that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. The care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choked the word and he becometh unfruitful. What was it? The deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world. It wasn't demonic powers. It's that we were, they gave themselves up to caring about themselves, what's in the world. You know, everyday living was just sucked them up. They didn't have no root. And so then they just it got choked out. They just, that was it. But then there was that that fell on good ground. It came forth, brought fruit, 100-fold, 30-fold, 60-fold. You know, it's just... Then another, let me read it to you again. In the book of Luke, same, same thing. What he said in the book of Luke. I believe it's Luke 8, 14. I think. And that which fell among the thorns are they which when they heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. They never bring it to maturity. They're never able to find that place in God. Why? Because they keep getting it choked out. 
your busy schedules, this hurriedness that we live in today will choke your spirituality. It's quiet in here. But I speak the truth. When I really went to a deep place in God, I mean a deep place in God, I had to give up everything. When I had that 14-day visitation from God where I heard the voice of God for 14 straight days, I mean, I just hearing it, hearing it. It was the most awesome time of my life. It had been prophesied that I was going to have it 12 years before I had it. Lasted 14 days. And when I lost it, I remember a boy was working on this roof on this little house out here and I felt bad in my office about him being out there by himself and I need to go help him. And when I went out and started helping him doing a physical thing, just, now this is, this is a preacher, I don't hate to preach this to saints because this is a preacher's level. This is deeper revelation. This is where you're walking straight in the voice of God. You've been hearing it for 14 days and you decide the roof on the house is more important than staying in that realm. And it was gone. But some of the things I'm preaching to you right now is some of the things that God showed me in that visitation. In Mark 11, when Jesus cursed the fig tree and went on down, cleansed the temple, came back, Master, the fig tree you cursed is dried up. It was symbolized, I believe, of natural Israel because it was going to dry and the spiritual Israel was going to come forth. But that's all here or there. But he said, have faith in God. And you can speak to that mountain and say, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and it shall be done. And when you get in the book of Revelation, when he's talking about the prayers of the saints and all these things that's happening against the book of Revelation, when, is, when the church is praying against the Jews that's trying to kill them in Revelation, and that's what it's all about. Book of Revelation is not some future time for us. Book of Revelation is about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Leviticus 26 promised God said, I'm going to send four sets of judgments on you, and he did. And the final set of judgments is going to be the total destruction of it. And it was. It's in the song of Moses in Deuteronomy if you want to read it. Moses sung about it thousands of years before it happened. Because this whole Bible is about one thing. And that's the coming of Jesus Christ and the transition from law to grace. And that's what this whole Bible is about from beginning to end. When the first seed was promised, thy seed is going to bruise that serpent's head. That was Jesus. Amen. And that's why these prophecies are there. And that's why Jesus said there ain't one. And Jesus said it's going to happen in this generation. Some people don't believe that. They still think it's some future generation. They're still out there chasing Antichrist and all this other stuff. And this guy's going to come. They're going to fly Jews over here to save them and all this. They're going to build a temple and they're going to offer these animal sacrifices. Jesus did away with all that with his sacrifice of himself. Because that's where you tie into dispensational theology, which is the biggest man-made lie of doctrine that's ever been created and has deceived the church in America so bad they don't know which direction to take right now. But anyway, one thing he showed me was right here. He said, but when they was praying, when they was praying the book of Revelation, you look at it in the book of Revelation, it says they prayed, a mountain was plucked up and cast into the sea. Yes, what is that? That's biblical imagery. I mean, you know, when you see it literally, it kind of brought into more of a literal sense, oh, God, help us, Lord, Protect us, avenge us of our adversaries. You know, all this stuff's going on. He said, that's the prayers of the saints coming up to God. 
Paul said he's going to, the wrath of God's coming on the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus. And he persecuted us. He said the wrath of God's coming on them to the uttermost. And it did. Jesus said there won't be one stone left upon another. And there wasn't. He said this temple's going to be plowed like a field. And it was. You're going to be scattered into all nations, you that's left alive. And they were. I'm going to tell you, when Jesus says it, you can mark it down, brother. Because you know why he said it? You know, even that prophecy was conditional, but read the book of Revelation. It says, because they repented not of their sin. And they did not turn to God. They stepped under law. Isaiah said they're going to trust in the law, the old law message of animal sacrifices, rather than trust in Jesus. He said, because they trusted in law, he said, that's going to happen. Pow. And so, he went on to say something that's done for me forever. He said, uh, whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. That made the text for my New Dimension series when I come out of that 14-day visitation. Whatsoever you desire. And God spoke to me and said the most powerful word in that whole sentence is desire. I said, what, God? He said, if you, he said, you know why people don't pray an hour? I said, why? He said, they don't have an hour's worth of desire for me. See, when your desires are being satisfied with the world, and you feel pretty good about yourself in the world, you really don't need to pray and you really don't need God intervening with any of that. Well, it's quiet in here. Man, you can hear an earwig crawling across the floor this morning. God got really tough with me. He'd spoke to me years ago in prayer in Colorado. And he told me, he said, in the day that you seek me with all your heart. And I went to say something. I want to say, God, there's been times of prayer. He said, you have never sought me with all your heart. And there. when he began to visit me right here in this church many years later he showed me the importance of that and when I made up my mind I was going to give him my heart that's when he came on me and he visited me for 14 days because all I thought of for 14 days was Jesus all I heard for 14 days was the Word of God. I couldn't even pray. I tried to get something going. It wasn't going. It was coming. It was coming this way. In the shower, I was hearing so much, I'd have to jump out and grab a pair of notes, try to catch up what I heard while I was in the shower. It just, it just was a one-way street. But then I decided that I would think about putting a roof on the house for a while. And I did. And he let me. And I lost it. Now, you've been saints. I don't expect you ever try to get in a dimension like that. But you've got to understand he was calling me to something. Preachers had prophesied it for years. He was calling, calling me to give me that revelation to give the apostolic movement. And most of them rejected it. But it's out there. And a lot of them are seeing it. But all I'm saying is this. The more you give him, the more he can give you. Amen. He said, have faith in God. You know what Hebrews says? In the book of Hebrews it says, 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the substance. You're actually making a substance by faith. But he goes on to say, He that cometh to God, in verse 6, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. The more you let Jesus be a part of your life, the closer you're going to be to him. And I'm going to tell you this. Here's the statement he gave me. Faith. This faith is really about faith. Because faith is what moves the mountains. Faith is what casts out the devils. Because this kind, he said, goeth out only by prayer and fasting. He said, faith. Yeah. Is born out of relationship. Amen. The more... How long y'all been married? 20? 21. 21. Ooh, that's a long time. I hadn't been married but 49. <laughs> the uh, more you're in relationship with her, the more you know about her, and the more you trust her. Now, I, gotta, I, call, I call him the muscle, her the brain, so the bunch. <laughs> I pick at them all the time. I say, I say, uh, you run it through the brains of the house. Yeah. The more you're in a relationship with him, the more you're going to know him. Paul said, I've counted all the things that I had in life. By Hebrew upbringing, set at the feet of Gamal, tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, I counted all but dung. That I might know him. Amen. I'm going to tell you, knowing Jesus is the most important thing you'll ever do in your life. Amen. And the only way you can know him is to make room in your life for him. Amen. Isn't this a dumb message? But it's, I mean, who ever heard of preaching a message with that title? But it's the truth today. Because what's hindering this church? from going to the place God wants it to go is we're so busy with just everyday living. We're not bound by demonic powers. We're just too busy to have the prayer time we need and to let Jesus into our life like he wants to be in there. And this is, I know most of you just going to ignore this. You're going to walk out because it's just another sermon. But I'm going to tell you, I don't believe this is just another sermon. Because God said he wanted to take us to a new level. And God told me to preach how to get there. And I'm, I'm a man that knows because I've been there. Amen. Thank you, Father. And if I don't stay there, I don't stay there. I lose it. When I'm not up on things, I struggle to hear the mind of God and the voice of God. I remember one time that during all that stuff that was going on, I got discouraged. I was praying, I was seeking God, and I, I backed off. I backed off and I said, God, it just ain't happening like I thought it would. You know, I thought my shadow was going to walk and heal people or something. I, and, and what it was, I didn't understand spiritual maturity. I didn't understand this thing is a spiritual growth process. Does this make any sense to you? It's a spiritual growth process. It's first 30 fold, then it's 60 fold, then 100 fold. He has to, you know, learn what he can trust us with and how much of this can I trust you with? And, and, uh, there's all kind of power in God. He's got some deep and secret things there. But, you know, just how much of it do you want? How much, how much can you get? But I, I got discouraged and I backed off my prayer time. I backed off my, every, you know, I just backed off. I just, you know. Instead of coming out here and praying from 6 o'clock to 10 in the morning, I just come down here and pray, you know maybe an hour backed off then I'd get, let other things get in my head you know just doing things you know I still come to church still preach the sermons occasionally hear a little something you know but all of a sudden I realized I'm not even hearing the voice of God like I used to what's going on and he spoke something that I didn't realize he said God and so I went back and I started praying again and I started seeking God I said, God what happened to me he said this thing that you sought is a spiritual growth process. 
But you got outside the realm of revelation. There's a realm of revelation that comes from God that you're not going to tap into unless you're seeking for it. I don't know if this makes any sense. In other words, normality is not going to get you there. I had to go back into that mode of extreme seeking to walk in the place that I've been walking where you heard the voice of God and you directed things and you knew things in the Holy Ghost and you felt things in the Spirit. Now, I ain't like some folks turn left, turn right. God ain't never done that to me. But he's, he's, there's times when he needs to speak to you or you need a miracle. It's there. But you've got to make time for God. Amen. He's more important than the sports teams. He's more important than your kids. He's more important than your mate. He's more important than the church. He's more important than anything. He is the number one most important thing that you've ever experienced in your whole life. Don't push him out of your life. Make room for him. I'm going to tell you what will happen if you do. Homes will get better. Attitudes will get better. Love will increase. Amen. The fruits of the Spirit will take over. Yes, Hello? And you'll be receiving things and your wife and you will both be happy Believe and glad it. that it happened. Amen. Yes, Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Praise God. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Right? Everybody said, well, that's just reverence. Uh, well, it, it's kind of like a reverence thing. It really is too. That's one way it is. But you know what? He tells you in, he, in Proverbs what the fear of the Lord is. He said the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. You've got to hate evil. You've got to learn to hate evil. America today don't hate evil anymore. We tolerate it. If you're really going to learn to love God and, 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 to, and to walk with Him, you've got to hate evil. It's got to do, it's like me, I can't, that's why I can't watch some of them, I couldn't watch some of those shows that go, oh God, I, they just turns my Holy Ghost upside down. I worry today, and i got to close, but i got, I got so many things that burden me. I don't, see, I don't get to preach much, and so I pretty well let Mike preach. But I got so many things that burden me. I'm burdened for our children because they just seem like all they want to do is play games. Yeah, play games. And do we ever really give them a? T I don't. I, I'm not against them so much. Just, just. You know. I, I mean. Are we ever giving them any time for God? Are we teaching them anything about Christ and all that? All they're going to do is grow up knowing how to beat somebody in a game. And, and, and they want to have an iPhone. And I'm telling you, you are not even have your iPhones out in church. You should not have a cell phone out in church. You don't, if you can't stay off Facebook and texting somebody for one hour, Jesus said you couldn't watch me in an hour. You know what that does? That makes visitors think, man, they don't even care. It makes me think you don't care. You know, what good it do to pray? You know, they're going to just play on their cell phone the whole service. That's disrespectful to the ministry. Right. It's disrespectful to God. It's disrespectful to His house. Amen. You charge me usury, interest, to preach you the gospel. Spiritual usury. You're not supposed to charge your brother usury. A double-minded man... James said, is unstable in all of his ways. 
Don't let that man think they're going to get anything from the Lord. You know what that tells me? It tells me you love somebody else more than you love Jesus and what the preacher's preaching. Now, I'm not against somebody having a phone if that's got work and they have to take a work text or something. I'm not against that. My cell phone runs my hearing aids, so you'll see me over here sometimes. When they're really getting with it up here, and I'm over here, I'm on mine for just a second because it's blowing my ears out or else I can't hear. My hearing aids don't have any adjustments on them. They're all right here in this thing. When you call me, I don't hear you out of here. I hear it out of here because it Bluetooths into my ears because I'm an old man who's got a one hip, one leg, and about half deaf, can't hear, can't have see. But I can still renew the inner man Amen. day by day. Amen. And that's where my hope is. It's the new inner man. It's not this outer anymore, that's for sure. I used to impress folks what I could pick up. I used to shock your brother before he passed away with that he was, his brother was a big weightlifter, championship world-class weightlifter. And one day I, we had an old concrete block out here, this was about 15 years ago, when I was still in my, I was just a young guy, I was still in my 50s, you know, I was young, I could pick up a train still. So I said, uh, he said, how y'all gonna move this, we need to move these concrete things around back. He said, well, how are we gonna move them? I said, we're gonna tote them. He went, <laughs> he, he said, he looked at my, my son, he said, I thought he was kidding. Till I looked back and he had one end of them up. And I knew he expected me to get the other. <laughs> I, said, I said, well, you better than the other three I had. Last time I picked them up, it took three on the other end while I carried one end. <laughs> All of them were younger than me. They were big old guys. They had three of them to carry one end of it. I had the other end, just carrying it over there. But I don't do that no more. Because this outer man's perishing. So I've got to make sure this inner man is renewed day by day. I've got to have a daily prayer life. Did I help you today? I hope I did. If you want to go to the next level, you're going to have to lay something aside and create time for Jesus in your life. It may not start big, if it starts with 15 minutes, start it. 30 minutes, whatever, you know, you can get in there. But you've got to, you know, just sit down and read your Bible sometime instead of reading something else or watching. Just read your Bible, focus on the Lord, and let him talk to you. Seek and pray. Good. I guarantee you, if you do that, there's another level for you yes. in the Spirit. He can take us there. We will allow him to fulfill prophecy he's given Amen. this church. Amen. I'm tough on you, but I love you. Jesus is tough on me, but I believe he loves me. Amen. Yeah, he's tough on me. I remember he told me that visitation, you know one thing he told me? He said, he said, what's the first commandment? Of course, me being a preacher, you know, I was glad to tell him. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He said, yes, and what else? He said, my people have obeyed that. I said, you got to love the Lord thy God with all their heart, all your mind, and all your strength. He said, that's my first commandment, not my first suggestion. Whew. That's pretty tough, ain't it? That's tough love. You sure you want to hear the voice of God? Because sometimes the things he cleans out of your life when he hears them, <laughs> you better be willing to let them go. You yeah, understand what I'm saying? Well, that's here or there, but I'm just telling you, he can, he can have some tough love, but you know what? He said, this is for my people's failing. They hadn't learned to love me with all their heart. They're always making room for everything else. Your love for him compared to your love for your family has got to seem like hate, but you've got to love your family. We we'll understand that. He goes on to say that in other places. You've got to rightly divide the word. But we've got to love him, first of all. Kingdom priorities. Making room for Jesus 
in our everyday schedule and habits. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand. You got two minutes to decide whether you're going to hell or heaven. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Praise God. One minute to 12. You didn't think I'd make it, did you? I didn't either, but I did. Good thing I skipped about half of it. No, I, praise God. I'm just kidding. Folks, I really feel that God gave me that. I really feel, if you'll listen to me, that it, it will bless you. How, how, you really, how many of you know I'm really telling you the truth? Amen. Let me ask you another question. How many of you really feel that your hardest thing you battle when it comes to being spiritual and seeking God is a busy schedule. How many of you really feel like that? See, I know that's me. I can hold up hands, toes, <laughs> lay down on my back, hold it. That's what I battle. Busy world we're in. We've got to slow it down enough to find God. Amen. Amen. We're going to one place. I believe God's, because here's what happens when you do. Now, yeah, just quickly, you remember when Brother Andy, my son Andy back there, somebody don't remember when he was overweight, had high blood pressure beyond anything. I mean, he should have been dead. He was, he was the walking dead. Amen. I, I can't remember what his blood pressure was. I mean, it was like, he went to the dentist, they wouldn't even work on his teeth. He went to call an ambulance for you. Something like 200 and something over 170. I mean, it just, it was, seemed like his low end was 170 something. Man, I said, man, you done died and don't know it. Scared us to death. But he was just living his life where he'd always lived it. But then all of a sudden, he began to realize he needed to make changes. His change would involve not only time for God in prayer, but it would be invite his diet. His schedule, everything. And now then, his blood pressure's normal. He's lost about 50 pounds. And he tries to spend time for God. And then when Brother Mike said, when he called Brother Mike last week, remember Brother Mike said, you know, God's dealing with me about the mind and all this stuff. And, and Brother Mike said, well, I'm going to preach on that. And uh, see, when we, get, when we all get the mind of the Spirit, we're all going to pick up the same thing. Did you notice the songs today were all about commitment? Did you notice that? Sacrifice, commitment. See, there's a mind of the Spirit that when we get in the mind of the Spirit and we make room for Jesus, we invite Him in, He will come in. He said, you know what? That knocking revelation, that was Jesus knocking on the door of the church <laughs> trying to get in. He said, if you'll let me in, I'll come in and sup with you. We need to let Jesus in our church. We need to let him run this church. We need to let, it's his church. He paid for it with his blood. Amen. We need to let him in. Let's, let, let's make room for him. Amen. Because I ain't never walked nothing like it. Well, start it now. Start it now. Make room for him. Somebody said, I can't do it. Yes, you can. Try it. You can. If you desire him, you can. Make room for him. He's going to bless us. We're, you know what's going to happen? We're going to get on one page here. Things are going to increase spiritually for this church. And there's blessings going to come. We've had blessings come already even this week, this month. We, we can see God's hand turning. God wanting to bless. God wanting to do things. It's happening already. We can feel it coming in anticipation. But we haven't even done our part yet. But we've got to do our part. Because if we don't, He can slow it down. Amen? Amen. He can always stop it. I don't want Him to stop it. I want Him to bring it on. Amen? Amen. Let's lift our hands to Jesus right now and thank Him for His Word. God, we love You. Thank You for the Word of God that You've given us, Lord. Thank You for what You put in that book, God, that we could research it, receive it. I thank You for putting this message in my heart that I could give it to the people. Because, Lord, I know right now all You want with this people is a relationship with them. All You want with me is to lead my life, guide my life, be the director of my life, Lord, to live in my spirit, to renew my spirit on a daily basis, to walk with You, Father. I know that, Lord, and I help each one one of us this week to start right now this week Lord not put it off another month or two but to start right now Lord to start this week to set time aside for you that we can find your will the prophecies can come forth that we won't hold back the prophecies but we will open them up to your spirit that we can receive these prophecies God and we're going to believe it Father I'm excited
excited about it, Jesus. And I thank you, God, for all you're doing for us. In Jesus' name. And everybody amen. said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Greet one another. Greet your brother, your sister. Amen. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God.